Welcome to this episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today I got Lou Ferrand. So Marcos helped me find sort of like little technicalities, and we reversed that case. So now I come back to court six and a half years later, by the way. This wasn't like 10 minutes later. I'm, I'm in jail six and a half years by the time I reversed the case. I reversed the case. I come back to court, and um, I said, I'm pleading not guilty now because all my co-defendants, there was eight of us. They're all gone. So now I'm alone. So it's hard to convict me of crimes I did with all these other people when I'm by myself over here. And they're already convicted. They're convicted. <laughs> Yeah, there are, yeah. And they're all stand up, Bill. None of them are going to come in and testify against me. Every one of them stood up. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to roll the dice. Now I know that they gave one guy the witness protection program. That's how they indicted us. They did eventually put a guy into the witness protection program. He was supposedly the main snitch against us. So I says, okay, I got to face this guy. But a lot of years passed. He was really close with another one of my co-defendants, not so much me. You know, we, we went on a couple of scores with him. We used him once in a blue moon, but he ain't got a lot to say about me. I'm going to take, I'm going to take a shot. So I call for a quick jury, you know, pick a jury 30 days or whatever it is. So in that time, the government moves to dismiss the case. And I said, Whoa, wow, I got lucky. So what happened here? Well, apparently what we learned is the guy who went into the witness protection program had violated the program and was thrown out of the program. As I understood it before we even took the pleas. So they never had a case against us, but so it was wild, but by the grace of God, this was what was meant to be because that's how going away all those years is how I changed my life around and how I realized I'm done with this life. I'm done with crime. I'm done with all that crap. Um, it was a snake pit. I don't trust any of the guys that were involved in that life. Only very few that I could consider my real friends. Yeah. And, um, and I was just done with it. And I changed my life around. I taught myself how to write. I became an author. And today, as I sit here with you today, I'm a best-selling author. My books have been translated into 20 languages around the globe. And I taught myself how to write in a prison cell. So I would have never had that opportunity had I known the guy violated the program because I would have rolled the dice and said, pick a jury then, not now. I would have had the case dismissed then. I would have never well, did Where would you be now? Where would you be now? You'd still be in the street. Something would have happened. That or I would have, yeah, I would have got clipped or maybe I would have got busted for something that got me life, you know, in the end. So I would have never, I wouldn't have been here talking to you. That's for sure. Yeah. My mind wouldn't have, wouldn't, wouldn't have shifted. So what caused you to write the book? Like how did all that transpire? And well, the new book, about- the, the book. new book I just wrote, which is the one I would love to talk about, it's yeah. called Borgata Rise of Empire. The new book was written because I took a trip to, I get invited all over the world to speak in engagements. I used to before COVID more so. And um, COVID, everybody does everything visual now, you know, like on online. But for the most part, I used to just hop on a plane and go anytime they invited me somewhere. And I was in Sicily and I met Lord George Weidenfeld, one of the biggest publishers of the 20th century. And Lord George asked me, he goes, I want you to write... I want to publish your next book. And I was like, whoa, you know, I came here to speak at a German media company, you know, like just uh, speak like something unrelated to books. They were sort of like a, they were a media company, but press, like daily press publications. You know, I'm there to speak at that. And I'm in Sicily. I'm enjoying Agrigento. It was more so like, you know, it's doubling as a sort of vacation to Sicily, which was great. And here I am offered a book deal. So the next day we had lunch overlooking the ruins of Agrigento and Lord George said to me, I want you to write a history of the American mafia beginning here in Sicily. And I'm like, whoa, wow. You know, it's like an offer I can't refuse. So yeah. yeah, it was wild. So he thought that what he believed was, look, given your past, you, you're the guy to write it because you were in the life, you were involved in it, you were around the biggest guys. You know, I was around the Caesars. You know, I might've been a, a Roman gladiator in the Coliseum because I was low and I was in the trenches every day. I wasn't any big, big ranking guy, but I'm around the biggest guys in mobdom. You know, Vicarina Jr. was, Vicarina Sr. rather, was the boss of the Colombo family. John Gotti's the boss of the Gambino family. Vic Musso, I pass his house every day. He's the boss of the Lucchese family. And Joe Messino, I pass his house every day. He's the boss of the the Bonanno family. I'm around these guys every day. And Chin Giganti, to this day, I'm 35 years late. I'm, I'm, I'm best friends with Chin's daughter, Rita Giganti, one of my dearest. Yeah, Rita. Shout out to Rita. Rita, I love. I love you, Rita. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I spoke to her this morning. Rita's yeah. the best, but I'm glad you did a shout out to her. So I'm in and out of Rita Giganti's house, although I didn't know the Chin. You know, I mean, Chin was in, this, in the city with his, living with his mother, walking around in a bathrobe. 
But, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm still friends with Rita. And there was a big beef because when, when Chin found out I'm in his house in Old Japan, Jersey, he went ballistic. He called Rita to the city. He goes, what's a guy from the Gambinos doing in my house? So she's like, he's my friend. He's my dear friend. He goes, I want him out of here. He's Didn't you walk around to robe on? Oh, bro, I got stories for you. Bro, I got stories for you you wouldn't believe. I used to drop off Rita and her mother, sometimes Rita or her mother, but usually Rita and her mother. I would stay there over the weekend at the house in Old Japan. And then Monday morning, I mean Sunday morning, I would drive them both to the bridge, to the George Washington Bridge, and then this guy Bruce would pick them up and bring them into the city to see Chin. So and, I, and now I would tell my friends at some point I kept it in the beginning. I kept it from them even that I'm with, I'm staying at Chin's house in Jersey. But at some point or another, I told them, I told Pete Gotti, I go, yeah. He goes, where do you disappear every, every weekend? You know, he thought maybe I'm taking a girl to the Poconos or something. Where are you going? Yeah. I says, no, I'm staying by Chin's house. He goes, Chin's house. What are you kidding me? So I go, yeah, I'm staying. It's, I'm close with the daughter. So PS, I would bring Rita and her mother Olympia to the, to the bridge. And then I would drop them off with this guy, Bruce, on the on the Fort Lee side, the Jersey side of the George Washington Bridge. And then I would shoot in, you know, back to Queens where I lived. And this old man, I only knew him as Bruce. He would get out of his car, an old jalopy. He drove an old ship box, white wool tires, hubcaps. I'm like, who the freak's got hubcaps? Who ever even heard of a hubcap? You know, it's like an antique hubcap. You got to buy a hubcap on eBay, right? Yeah. So I'm like, who is this? You know, so this, this old, old man... He would give me like a wet fish handshake and he'd go, how you doing, Louie? And I'd say, hey, how you doing, Bruce? And I'd pass off the ladies, Rita and her mother, to Bruce. And then I would shoot in, shoot over the bridge and go home. So years later, I never, I just thought he was some like Shimon Eid that Chin was sending to pick up his, his wife and his daughter to bring them in on Sunday for dinner with the mother at the apartment. I never knew who this guy was. I just figured like he was just a guy who runs errands for Chin. Years later, I'm in jail and I was, I was, I think I was with Joe Watts and he was reading the newspaper and he says, Oh, Bruce, Bruce Palmieri died, the chins guy. I said, Bruce Palmieri. So, whatever it was, there was a picture and he shows me and I go, Son of a bitch, that's Bruce, the guy, Vito Bruce Palmieri. I knew him as Bruce. He was a captain with the Genovese crew with the West Side. Yeah. I had no idea, no idea. So, I'm going to give you a, that's how low key chins guys what you wanted to give this guy a bowl of soup you never knew in your wildest dreams he was a skipper meanwhile this guy's a skipper and i had no idea you know so i mean that's like give you an idea how low key the west side was on the chin yeah. i mean that's like the best way i had no idea who he was i wouldn't have guessed he was a skipper in a million years the, the, all the skippers i knew what you could see there were tough guys from a mile away this guy, you know, was a low key guy. He's like, hey, don't go. He shook my hand, gets in the car, he can just see over the wheel, can't even see over the wheel. And I'm like, son of a bitch, man. So, but anyway, it gives you an idea. So, getting back to the book, Lord George asked me to write the book. I'm like, you know what? I was around the biggest people, the biggest families. I was in the trenches. I know what it is to make a buck. I know what it is to go to jail. I know what it is to, to you know, to have a gun to your head and to have a gun to somebody else's head. The whole thing, I know it's soup to nuts, this life. You know, I mean, a gun to your head, meaning like in a bad, you know, in tough position, not literally speaking, but you understand. Yeah. So I said, you know what? Let me, maybe I, maybe this is for me. So I thought it would, my other books took me a year to write. So I figured, oh, it's going to take me like a year, maybe two. It took me seven years. I locked myself in a room for seven years. And uh, I think I wrote what is appearing to be the New York Times covered it, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post. NPR news, left and right publications have all covered the book and they're hailing it. A lot of publishers weekly hailed it as one of the best books written about the mob. As we sit here today, I may have written the book about mafia history. And what I do in the book, just so you know, Bill, you got, you, you're a guy who likes the real stories. So you appreciate the real stories. A lot of people who watch mob stories, they'll watch a documentary or they'll read a book. Frank Costello did this. Albert Anastasia did that. So volume one is history of the mob. I, I get up to date by volume two and three, but volume one is the old style Lucky Luciano days. When I read these stories, I know right away, if it makes sense, it could have happened or it didn't. Yeah. I mean, you know, like if you hear Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello did this, that, and the other thing, you know, if it's true or not, or you know, if it's bullshit, like for example, I read Albert Anastasia, 
pushed around the baby stroller as he was trying to clock Thomas Dewey and see his movements. Albert Anastasia was a boss at the time. He ain't pushing around a baby stroller. He'd send some, you know, some, some dude to do to go do it for him. He yeah. ain't doing that himself. So I go, come on, who made up this story? So time and again, then there were stories like where I knew people involved, like towards the end of the book, towards the end of volume one, Borgato, Rise of Empire. I urge all your listeners and viewers to go get the book. If you love mob history, read the book. But towards the end of volume one, I talk about Frank Costello dies. And they said somebody blew up the crypt. So they said that Frank Costello, they said Lilo Galante did it, Carmine and Lilo Galante, who went on to become the boss, sort of like acting boss uh, or pretender to the throne of the Bonanno family. He was an underboss, but he tried to take power from Rusty Rustelli. And they said that he always hated Costello, so he blew up the, the crypt. And I go, come on, man. This guy's a grown man. He's not a vandal. This is, he's going to commit vandalism? Like he got out of jail and he's just going to go attach a little bomb to his crypt? That's something a kid would do. There's no way. So I talked around. I spoke about it with a few people I know. And I had an old timer who said, Louie, we did that. I said, what? He goes, yeah, we were looking for the gold. I go, what? What goes, look, he had no kids and grandkids. He was a bazillionaire. We figured he was buried at least with a gold watch, a gold chain, gold pinky ring. And gold went from like $20 an ounce to 200 an ounce. And he goes, so we figured he's, you know, go get the gold. And I go, you got to be kidding me. So, you know, notwithstanding that my friend just admitted to being a grave robber, but whatever the case is, he goes, we were looking for the gold. So in the end, I said, let me see if I could verify this. So I went and I looked. When Costello died, gold was like $24 an ounce. When the when the, the crypt was blown up, it went to like $190 an ounce. So there's your proof. Was there any gold? Did they get any gold? I didn't, you know, I didn't get into it. I don't, you know, there's questions I don't ask, right? So, the, yeah. you know, it's like, I couldn't believe he was giving me what he gave me, which was a gem. But, uh, you know, I didn't say, did you pull the ring off his, off his skeletal finger? I didn't get that deep. But whatever the case is, I also found an article that said the body was tampered with. Nobody ever talked about that. So it made sense. What my friend told me was legit. But whatever the case is, that's one myth I was able to debunk. But there's there, throughout the whole book, I talk about Bugsy Siegel when he was clipped in Vegas. I break down why he was killed. There's a lot of stories that are out there. It's bullshit that he was robbing with Virginia Hill. They got mad at him. That was the propaganda the mob put out. A lot of times the mob puts out its own propaganda to hide the real reason why they're doing something. You know, they, they're not going to tell you why they're making a move. You know, if we killed Bill Stacks for his money, we're not going to tell you we killed Bill Stacks for his money. You know, like a guy like Sam. You're going to say Stacks was stealing and we had to kill him because he was trying to steal from us. Exactly. Exactly. We found out that Stacks was robbing this and Stacks was robbing that. And they'll throw in maybe you dated a woman after she lost her husband. They'll say, well, Stacks started dating her before the husband was dead. So you're not allowed to do that. And meanwhile, you'll be like, no, I never touched her. I never even talked to her before the husband was dead. Well, we just, you know, we shifted a few months back and we say Stacks was seen with her. At, you know, at Spumoni Gardens before the husband was clipped, before the husband died. So now we think Stax was effing, the, you know, F, you know, fooling around with the wife. Yeah. All these stories are usually made up to cover what the real reason was, which was we wanted Stax's money. So the mob puts out its own propaganda. So time and again, when I would spot the mob propaganda, I would break it down for the reader. And I've had a phenomenal response. People have emailed me and saying, you know, I just knew something was wrong with this. And until you broke it down for me, I never knew exactly what it was. Thank you. So I'm getting a lot of that. I'm getting a lot of, you know, I'm debunking myths throughout. Yeah, the whole so you, you break down the myth, right? On what mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And then you explain right. what you think happened or do you, you do the research to find out what really happened? Both. Exactly. Great question, Bill. I do exactly both. I'm, so usually I'll do as much research as I can to see if where the story might have came from and figure out the origin if it was false where it might have came from so if i could tell you the origin maybe you'll know then we could figure out that it's not true the next thing i do is try to figure out what really happened and then i break down what the bet into the best of my knowledge and the best of my research and the best opinion with my own insights and experience this is what probably happened and if you're reading the book and you're learning you know as you go as i'm going through the stories my, my goal is to make i don't have to make you a a, a I don't have to get your mind into the mobology. You're in it already. You understand it. But the average casual reader who picks up the book, I want them to understand it too. 
you know, somebody who reads other things too, but just picks up a mob book once, once in a blue moon. They don't understand the stories. They don't know. They don't have sort of that bell that goes off like you would have or I would have when we hear something that's not true. We know this, we know this life. So the bell goes off. You're, you're, you're involved with it every day. I was involved with it every day. They don't, your average reader goes to Barnes and Noble, picks up the book. Maybe he's a bus driver. Maybe he reads two mob books a year. So I'm trying to get him to think like a mobster too. So by the time he puts down the trilogy, he's going to go, wow, I'll spot something in a minute now if it's not true. Yeah. I, or I'll see a documentary. Last night I was watching, I got off my last bus route and I'm watching a documentary before I fell asleep on History Channel. Bang. I read the book. Lou taught me how to think. And I spotted that shit right away. <laughs>